afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the MIT Alumni Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network's monthly webinar for May. Today we have a, a topic of electricity storage at scale, high value added, with two excellent speakers who Raymond will introduce in a moment, although they're already on your screen. Uh, the EESN is dedicated to connecting alumni from MIT and other people in the public on the, the big issues that are going on today, setting up a clean future, clean energy, preserving our environment, and making it sustainable, basically, life cycle kinds of questions. The webinar today is a webinar. The chat function is disabled for the attendees, but you can put questions into the question and answer uh, function on Zoom. The chat will be open though for panelists to provide extra information for the audience so you might see a little dot there that that'll that'll give you a url or something um, and we are pretty strict about the one hour time frame uh, but we're going to get going pretty darn quick here and we we welcome you it's certainly a very big issue this issue of battery storage i just heard it the phrase, and I don't know where it came from, that the battery storage is the, going to be the Swiss Army knife of the electric supply system. Um, the, um, the the power system and our, our energy systems have, have are changing so rapidly. We've got to do energy efficiency is one thing, but the battery storage is going to help us use all kinds of energy from everywhere. Um, the distributed energy that that most of the industrialized nations grids do not recognize yet uh, they're beginning to, to be changed and modernized so we can do that. So with that, let me hand this over to Raymond to introduce our speakers today. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers. I think it's, it's an interesting topic. It's a complex topic. So we're very fortunate to have them uh, help explain this to us. So uh, first we'll have Matt Harper uh, from the class of 11 here. Uh, he is a former founder and president of Avalon Battery um, and has been developing and producing vanadium flow batteries for heavy duty applications for over 15 years. He's currently the chief commercial officer at Infinity Energy Systems, focused on accelerating our transition to a low carbon grid. Uh, for over 25 years, he's been doing pioneering work in electrical uh, energy storage, low carb um, wastewater treatment, hydrogen generation and fuel cell vehicles. His uh, holistic approach to industrial technology development has balanced technical and operational uh, development with commercial and organizational life cycle characteristics. He's the inventor of several patents related to clean energy and industrial technologies. So he'll speak first. Then uh, Darik Malapragada, if I pronounce it correctly, is a uh, research scientist at MIT Energy Initiative, uh, MITE. His current research focuses on advancing uh, energy systems modeling tools to study the implications of renewables integration into the power sector, um, economy-wide electrification, and the assessment of emerging ed energy technologies. Prior to that, he spent nearly five years in the energy and petrochemicals industry, working on a range of sustainability-focused research uh, topics. Most recently at ExxonMobil, Corporate strategic research, uh, working on uh, research on power systems modeling, technology life cycle assessment, and uh, leading a research program to study energy challenges in developing countries. Uh, he has an MS and a PhD from um, Purdue University and a bachelor's from Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. So we welcome both of you. And uh, without any further uh, delay, uh, Matt, uh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Good, thanks very much, Ron. Um, I am just checking to see if everyone actually sees my slides. Great, well, look, uh, th thanks very much. Um, look, my, uh, my, what I wanna do here today is talk a little bit about sort of the case for energy storage. Um, and because you know, one of the things that I often find is um, there's so much conversation around energy storage going on in the marketplace right now. Um, what we really want to do is to, you know, what I always think is, is useful. Oh, hold on. I'm just going to switch. 
Presentation. There we go. There we are. Thank Perfect. You. Great. Uh, you know, I always find it useful to sort of go back to first principles and sort of uh, explore a little bit why it is that we care so much about uh, energy storage. Um, you know, the thing that I always go back to when I sort of talk to people for the first time about storage is, you know, you think about sort of how humanity uses resources. And, you know, we've th these incredible inflection points in human evolution have uh, come about by how we use our resources, right? We, you know, we're able to come off the plains and hide out in caves, protecting ourselves from, you know, scary animals because we were able to transport water. Later, we were able to transport that water, you know, over a great distance into cities, you know, leading to some of the, you know, infle inflection points and in sort of social development that came about sort of two to 3,000 years ago. Um, you know, in the last couple of hundred years, we've seen tremendous inflection points in terms of, you know, how we manage energy, especially around liquid fuels, right? We're able to store, um, you know, huge amount of liquid fuels, uh, you know, so that they can be used as needed. We're able to transport those liquid fuels around the world with tremendous efficiency. We've never been able to do that time function with electricity. You know, I often say to people, you know, the way the electric grid operates right now, it, you know, it may be the most, you know, the biggest and most complex and most amazing machine that's ever been built. But, you know, electric, you know, imagine if water needed to be consumed the instant it fell from the sky. That is effectively the situation we have today with our electricity system. Now, the thing is that that hasn't mattered up until now because, you know, we've always been, uh, you know, in a mode where we were generating electricity either by, you know, by burning things or by splitting atoms or by, you know, making water fall through dams. Um, but as we move to sort of the renewable space uh, and, and increasingly, you know, generating uh, electricity from renewable sources, we, we lose that control. Um, why that matters is that, you know, and the question is sort of why that matters now is um, around the world, uh, renewable sources are becoming the lowest cost source of electricity anywhere. And, you know, I think if you think, if you look back sort of five or 10 years in history, you know, people were talking about solar or wind generation from sort of an ecological perspective or a sustainability perspective, but it's now, you know, unequivocal that, you know, the lowest cost way of generating electrons is from renewable sources. What that means is that obviously there's a huge incentive to build those sources over, um, you know, fuel-based alternatives, you know, both for, again, sustainable, sustainability reasons, but also because of, uh, you know, the, the basic economics of that. Question is, what does that do to our electricity system? Um, and, what, you know, one of the ways that I like to visualize this is to think about, you know, the, 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 you know how a, a, a local, you know, energy system is dispatched to serve demand, um, and, and what, you know, what this is, what this is showing you, this is a, this is a hypothetical dispatch curve from, from one of the energy systems, um, you know, domestically, um, and, and what this graph shows you is, is this is essentially a decision making graph um, for how, uh, you know, the energy system operator brings certain resources to bear to be able to meet the demand that's required at any given time on the electric grid. Um, and what you can see is that, you know, all of the renewable sources are being, are at the sort of the far left-hand side of the graph because they essentially have zero marginal cost of production, right? People are bidding those resources into the electricity system, you know, at essentially zero price because they know they're gonna get the market clearing price anyway. They wanna be, be sure that they're the first resources that are dispatched. As you go kind of like off to kind of the, 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 the right-hand side of this graph, you know, you're looking at the, the more expensive variable sources, you know, the peaking plants, so the, the plants that come on, you know, 20 to 50 hours a year to match that absolute peak demand as and when it's needed. The challenge is that if you think about what happens to this graph with when, the, when those low-cost renewable sources on the left-hand side become intermittent, this entire graph will shift right and left as though as that intermittency manifests itself. And that, you know, because of the, you know, the, the, the relative elasticity of price on the right hand side of this grid, that means that you end up with these tremendous fluctuations in electricity prices. That is a huge challenge and, and, and one that, you know, not only from a technical perspective, you know, in terms of how we ensure resource adequacy, but also from the perspective of how do we make sure that we've got an, a grid that functions in an, you know, an economically viable way is becoming a very large problem. So where do we see that problem manifesting itself in the electric grid system? Um, this is a screenshot showing um, electricity prices, uh, you know, uh, recently um, from uh, from uh, a couple well, a couple of years ago in April in California. Um, you know, what you're seeing here is, you know, prices that, um, you know, for a couple of hours a day are at 50 times the average cost. Be again, because of that, that fluctuation in, in, you know, driven by intermittency. 
Similarly, you've got negative pricing on the other side of it, because once you have those intermittent sources ramped up and generating, when all of a sudden, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of solar comes back online, you know, you start to get negative prices. You need to do something with that electricity and the grid operator will actually pay people to absorb that electricity to maintain the balance of voltage and frequency. Um, we start to see, you know, we're seeing this in electricity systems all over the world. Um, you know, this is a view more recently from, you know, the, the California um, spot prices for January last year. You know, you see, you know, four or five hours a day where the, the spot prices are, are, are in fact negative. They're, the, you know, California is paying people to take energy away from their grid system in order to maintain balance. We see this in, you know, starting to crop up in a lot of jurisdictions that have a huge amount of renewable penetration. Um, you know, for example, Europe, very similar situation. Um, you know, you see negative pricing, uh, you, know, you know, regularly starting to happen. Um, we've seen this, you know, especially over the last year when, um, you know, when, when there was decreases in electricity demand based around the, you know, the pandemic, uh, you know, sort of springtime of, uh, of last year. Um, finally, you know, just by way of example, you know, we do, uh, my business does a lot of work with, in Australia and, you know, you see very, very similar situations in Australia, right? The amount of renewable generation through, through wind and yellow, which are the, the yellow sections of that graph in the top right, are, are in excess of the absolute demand in a particular region that drives, you know, not only instability and inefficiencies in how the generation happens, but it drives, um, you know, negative pricing that can be very challenging to manage um, for the grid operator's perspective. So with that as sort of the problem space, the question is, you know, how do we, how do we, how does flow, how do flow batteries fit in on that storage landscape? Well, you know, when we think about, you know, how we, how we describe the overall storage landscape, you know, we usually think about it, um, you know, with a, on, a, on, a, on a series of axes that look like, looks like this. We think about the number of cycles per year where a battery needs to charge and discharge, and then the number of hours, uh, you know, that the battery needs to charge and discharge for every time it's called into place, into play. And, you know, if, you know, with, with those, within those, within those two axes, you can plot a number of different applications where storage can, in theory, come and make a material difference to how we operate our grid. Um, you know, everything from the operating reserves, which are, you know, the very, very, you know, frequent but short duration um, services that essentially, uh, you know, m make sure that, that, that over a very short period of time, the sufficient, you know, there's sufficient generation to cover demand. Also, you know, maintaining the, 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 the voltage and the frequency frequency um, on the grid within within a specified range, you know, falls into that, you know, that far left category. Um, you know, in the middle of this graph, you see a lot of sort of, um, you know, shifting of renewable power, right? How do we take wind and, and, and deliver it, you know, through the, through the course of the day? How do we take solar and use that to generate, um, you know, baseload power overnight? And then finally, all the way to the right of this graph, we talk about resilience. We talk about, you know, can you take renewable power and use that to uh, to support, you know, grid outages or 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 you know, air, regions in the world where you only have 18 hours of good power on the grid over the course of the day? Can you use storage to uh, to, to 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 mitigate some of those gaps? And the answer is you absolutely can. What we see um, is 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 that there are, um, you know, if you look at where uh, storage has played on the electric grid to date. You know, really, lithium-ion batteries are are tremendously capable at serving the bottom left-hand side of this graph. You know, may, you know, peaker replacement, making sure that um, that you know the 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 grid, the the elements or the batteries that are serving that right side of that dispatch grid. You know, dispatching you know, maybe a hundred times a year for a couple hours at a time to make sure that the absolute peak requirements of the grid's demand are met. That's a phenomenal application for lithium-ion batteries. The challenge, of course, is the, you know anyone who uh, you know has charged and discharged their their cell phone you know every night for a couple of years will recognize is that you know lithium ion batteries are limited in their ability to cycle indefinitely, right? They you know after a couple hundred or several you know small number of thousand cycles, they're only providing a portion of what they were what, of what they were uh, doing uh, on day one. That's where we step in. You know, our battery is, uh, you know, the vanadium uh, flow batteries that we make are, dis are designed around, um, you know, either very, very long storage durations or very, very high cycle counts because, you know, we, the, the inherent in a flow battery is that you don't see the kind of cycle-based degradation that you see in a conventional battery. 
people often ask us, uh, um, you know, what does that, you know, what does that mean in terms of your, your, your competitive position? Are you trying to displace lithium? And, you know, the, the, the graph we always love to, or the graphic we always show is this, you know, both of these devices that you see on screen here are, you know, devices with internal combustion engines and four wheels. Right. They serve a very, very different purpose. And, you know, although lithium has enjoyed tremendous commercial success in terms of serving that one portion of the storage landscape, our view is that as storage evolves as uh, a, a, a part of our electric grid, um, that there will be a, a split in terms of the different applications that different technologies can serve and, uh, and how, we, how, how those benefits can be delivered. In terms of what our flow battery is and what it does, you know, the, the real the six benefits that we usually talk about, you know, are fundamentally based around that lack of degradation. Um, you know, we don't see a degradation in, in, in the performance of the battery with a number of different cycles. Um, that means we can hit very, very high utilization. We can drive, we want to drive these batteries as hard as possible as many hours per day. What that does is it delivers very compelling economics in terms of you know the, the absolute cost of delivering a megawatt hour out of a battery over its life is quite a bit lower than uh, than than comparable technologies. Um, one of the one of the one of the um, misnomers about flow batteries is that you know we can respond very very quickly. It is you know even though we're pumping a liquid electrolyte in order to have the charge and discharge reaction happen, um, you know there you know we it's still an electrochemical electrochemical device where we can respond to changes and demand, you know, within, uh, within milliseconds. Um, you know, finally, we have some advantages in terms of sort of the sustainability of materials. You know, most everything in our battery is, is fundamentally very recyclable. If, you know, the, the liquid electrolyte that stores the energy is infinitely reusable because, as I said, it doesn't degrade. The rest of the system, you know, 95% of it could literally go in your curbside recycling bin. It's, 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 it's very, very conventional materials that we work with. Um, what does that mean in terms of operation? You know, going back to this point about uh, about a lack of degradation. Well, um, you know, this is just a, a quick graph that sort of drives the point home a little bit in terms of you know what you would get out of one of our 220 kilowatt hour modules over and and as compared by comparison with. Um, a lithium battery of, of, of similar capability. And, you know, again, it's because of that, you know, not having a degra degradation in capacity, but also being able to deliver that non-degraded capacity over 25 years, you know, we're able to, to deliver, you know, a lot more kilowatt hours out of a, out of a single unit than, uh, than, than other solutions. Um, you know, uh, Ramon, you, you mentioned at the, uh, at the at the top of actually, I think it was Ramon, maybe it was you, Sarah, uh, talked about um, storage as the Swiss Army knife for uh, for um, for the uh, for the grid, and you know, I think it's absolutely true. What's interesting about that, though, is, you know, to extend the analogy, and hopefully this isn't, I'm doing this on the fly, so it's not too much of a stretch, but, you know, with a with a lithium ion battery or with any battery that degrades every time you cycle it, you know, think about, you know, that's like using the knife on your Swiss Army knife and having every other tool inside that device dull as you're using it. The way that, you know, the, the, one of the best things about having a, a, a battery storage system that doesn't degrade with cycle life is that you can use it for multiple applications in parallel. And, you know, this is a, this is a dispatch profile curve from um, one of the projects that we built recently in South Australia. And essentially what we're doing here is not only are we taking solar generation in the middle of the day and dispatching it into the evening when it's most valuable, but we're also dispatching into, you know, the morning period um, based on energy absorbed overnight. And we're also, you know, 24 hours a day, uh, addressing the sort of the 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 frequency and voltage um, fluctuations on the electric grid, so really stacking those three different applications on top of one another, using different tools out of that Swiss Army knife, all at the same time, all in one uh, in one project, and 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 that you know in our view is how uh, you get the most value and most benefit out of one of these batteries over its lifetime. Um, just a quick look inside one of our batteries. You know, we talk about this as a flow battery. That's literally because we are flowing uh, a liquid electrolyte that is stored in two big electrolyte tanks. We're flowing that through what we call our cell stacks, which is where that charge and discharge reaction actually takes place. That separation of energy storage in the electrolyte tanks and power generation in the cell stacks allows us to, to really manage that, um, that charge and discharge reaction very effectively. Um, it means that we can expand those tanks at very, very low incremental cost if we want to go from four to eight to 12 hours of, uh, of storage duration, as an example. Um, and also it, managed, it allows us to manage the, um, you know, the, 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 the thermal characteristics of, of managing that charge and discharge reaction, again, to promote that very, very long, very durable life cycle of, uh, of, uh, of one of these devices. Um, 
people often ask us what the heck is vanadium um you know where you've probably seen it before is is in you know uh, if you've got a you know a box of wrenches in your garage somewhere you know chrome vanadium is one of the materials that's used to, to strengthen hand tools um it is one of the most abundant elements on earth it's the 13th most common element in the earth's crust um, more available than copper, typically used in 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 steel strengthening. Um, and so, you know, it's although it's available all around the world, where it's generally produced is is in close proximity to uh, to steel production. Just talk to so that's the technology in general. Just to talk, I'll give you guys a really quick overview about Infinity. Um, you know, our view is that uh, you know we're uh, is that this renewable shift is going to stall without energy storage for all the reasons we talk about. Lithium-ion batteries are not going to meet all of the future needs, some but not all, um, and that we deliver the alternative to uh, to that solution. Um, you know, we uh, were established last year through a merger of two companies, Red Tea Energy and Avalon Battery. Avalon was the company that I was the founder of back in 2013. Um, you know, and we've got, uh, you know, all of the, the trappings that you would expect of a, a technology company like ours um, and are really operating um, all around the world to uh, deliver uh, these projects to our customers today. And I think I will leave it there. That's great. Thank you very much, Matt. That's super. Good introduction. And we've got a bunch of questions that we will get to after we have our second speaker. Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce Derek Malapragada and have him talk to us about some of the studies and things going on at the MIT Energy Initiative. Thank you, Sarah. Let me just get my um, screen up. Let me know if you can see my screen. You're good. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Darek Malapragada. I'm a research scientist at the MIT Energy Initiative. And um, you know, following that great introduction from Matt, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, you know, the research we're doing at uh, Mighty uh, to think about you know, the long run value of energy storage as we think about deep decarbonization of not just electricity systems, but more broadly energy systems. Um, so you know, the everybody has their own favorite analogy. This is one of my uh, favorite charge from my colleague uh, Patrick Brown, who you know, who sort of looked at the variability of um, renewables availability, um, and sort of overlaid that with the load variability that you would see, you know, um, and you can do this for any region. But he did, looked at this for Texas in 2015, um, and you know, this I think illustrates the case for energy storage, which was I think very well made by Matt in his earlier remarks, which is that you see, um, as you have systems where you're trying to meet just-in-time delivery of electricity to manage supply and demand variations, as you're adding more variability on the supply side, you end up with uh, vari variations that occur over multiple time scales. And, and so, you know, with solar, for example, you see variations that occur through the course of a day where solar peaks, and then you have declining solar towards sunset and, and sunrise. Uh, with wind, you start to see these sort of long periods of variability, uh, in this case in January. Um, and you also get periods of cloudy days that may be correlated with that, that, that could lead to sort of even longer periods of uh, variability. So this kind of makes the case for why energy storage is, you know, particularly interesting. And, and you know, we are trying to think about the role for energy storage from sort of this multi multi-dimensional um, challenge that, um, you know, we, we see here and in some ways an opportunity for a variety of energy storage technologies to be deployed. So, um, you know, going with the Swiss Army knife analogy, there's multiple different use cases for energy storage. And uh, this is a report from the EIA from, a two, from about two years back, looking at um, the capacity of energy storage deployments in the US. And you can see that the, the curve is very much on an exponential growth trend. Um, and then they're broken down here by regions. Uh, so obviously you see a lot of activity in California, uh, but I'd like to focus on sort of these applications here where you're starting to see um, you know, many different applications exist for energy storage, um, but as the costs of batteries come down, particularly lithium ion batteries, but also other technologies, you're increasingly shifting in terms of the time scale over which energy storage is becoming relevant. So frequency regulations is in some ways the shortest time scale um, in the power system context over which, um, you know, uh, energy storage would be relevant. But now as, as you have cheaper costs of just storing energy resulting from cheaper battery storage costs, uh, you're able to sort of think about applications that are increasingly moving into the space of uh, providing energy rather than just providing power. Uh, and so some examples that I've listed out here, uh, again, this is a, this is these, some of these new stories are a bit dated, but they kind of give you an indication of the scale of deployments that are being contemplated. 
so one one point i wanted to highlight was uh, you know energy storage comes in many forms and introduces complexity in grid operations um, through a couple of different ways and so let me just pull through all of the animation on the slide um, it's somehow yep um, so you know there is the there is first the aspect that you know all energy storage does not look the same so matt you know kind of described very well sort of the differences between traditional lithium ion batteries which are closed systems where you have limited degrees of freedom with respect to energy capacity and power capacity versus flow systems that sort of have different degrees of freedom here uh, versus you could think about systems that look more like hydrogen storage where you have uh, potentially the option to sort of independently size the the electrolyzer the hydrogen storage system as well as the fuel cell if 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 that is turned that turns out to be economical uh, versus other systems that are more geographically constrained which could include compressed air energy storage or pumped hydro storage which is the dominant form of energy storage today so there's a there's a diversity here um, and and this diversity is coupled with the fact that many of these technologies not all can also be deployed at, at different points in the electricity supply chain, starting from you know the grid scale storage applications, which is where uh, you know most of my presentation will focus on, but also sort of end use applications closer to customers, both residential and commercial customers, uh, where there are a number of um, considerations why you know distributed energy storage might be very valuable. Um, finally, the, the sort of the key element of energy storage that, that introduces complexity into the grid is the fact that it couples operations from one hour to the other. And this is illustrated in this example chart of a dispatch for a system uh, for the power system in India, where if you have energy storage sort of charging up during the middle of the day when you have high solar and discharging late at night, um, you're inherently linking the dispatch of the system across the entire day. And this linking creates challenges when you have uncertainties with respect to load. Uh, as well as the availability of resources. And so this complexity needs to be thought through as we think about the assessment of energy storage technologies and their value uh, and where they where they would be most beneficial. So in our group, we have been trying to sort of think about these questions from the perspective of trying to model what future grids would look like and what are the cost optimal pathways for decarbonizing the energy, uh, the electricity system and more broadly the energy system as a result. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, variability is kind of critical to incorporate in these types of assessments. And so our, our modeling toolkit um, builds on, you know, our understanding of variability in resources, primarily renewables, but also variability in demand coupled with all of the complexity that one needs to account for with respect to the operational detail to capture uh, the value of resources like energy storage. Um, and then electricity markets come also in many different forms and have different regulations around, you know, how, uh, costs are recovered, and so we can represent many of those features in our model as well. So in today's uh, presentation, I want to give you sort of two quick case studies that sort of highlight, um, you know, the the approaches that these types of system modeling tools can be used for to understand the value of energy storage. So one of this is a paper that came out last year, uh, looking at sort of the system value of battery storage in the bulk power system, where we were particularly focused on storage technologies represented by lithium ion uh, type storage. And we wanted to look at sort of the various capacity, various services that energy storage could provide going from energy, network deferral, operating reserves, as well as capacity deferral, and looking at the stacked value that energy storage could recover from participating in all of these markets, recognizing that some of these um, markets might be coincident and may not be available at the same time. Uh, and so understanding the value side of the equation will help us then understand, you know, where the costs are today and where the, you know, where the where the costs are likely to be in the future and how much you know value that energy storage can provide to the system. So we ran our case studies for two different types of regions, one looking at you know conditions that are similar to the Northeast uh, and other looking at conditions similar to the, the Texas region. Um, and what I'm showing you here in this chart um, is to look looking at the sort of the incremental value of energy storage for different levels of renewables penetration in the system, going from 40%, 50%, 60% of annual generation uh, for different levels of storage deployment as a percentage of peak demand. So there are a couple of interesting results that we found from this study, which was related to the fact that, you know, increasing energy storage um, reduces the incremental marginal value of these resources. So they sort of compete with one another, but at the same time, increasing renewables penetration is strongly correlated with increasing value for energy storage. Um, and then, you know, sort of thinking about these valuations, one can then compare those valuations against, you know, what one thinks are the costs of these resources to get a sense of, you know, what's the cost optimal deployment of energy storage in these types of systems. 
another interesting piece of the analysis was that we were able to sort of decompose this value into the various contributors. Um, and when we break down these, these value contributors, uh, what we see is that um, network deferrals, uh, as well as capacity deferral, namely in reducing the amount of renewables that you would need to deploy to get to a particular renewable generation goal, um, as well as deferral of thermal capacity by having the availability of storage to provide generation during times of low renewables availability. Those three components are among the major drivers for value. Um, and so the, the arbitrage value implicitly is tied to the capacity deferral value. And so uh, how this value can be monetized in, in electricity markets today is, is an open question in terms of you know, how capacity markets uh, quantify the value of energy storage. And you know, perhaps there are ways in, in quantifying that, but you know, this analysis kind of points to sort of the, the capacity substitution value as being the dominant driver for energy storage. Um, so sort of building on that theme, you know, one of the questions that has become a hotly debated issue is around sort of the ability of storage to displace gas generation. And so I'd, I'd like to start out by saying that, you know, storage in gas generation are sort of very different entities on, on the power system. One is a generation resource, one is an energy storage resource. But sort of in the context of these experiments, one can start to look at, um, you know, how the storage configurations and the system configurations influence the dis displacement of natural gas generation in the system. So what you see is that systems with uh, storage systems which have longer durations tend to get larger natural gas uh, displacement, um, all else remaining equal. Um, and you start to see similar effects um, that, that are available sort of irrespective of the re resource variability. Um, you also start to see some marginal decline in, in substitution value as you start to increase renewables penetration, which is indicating that you need longer and longer durations to sort of get rid of the last units of gas in the system, presumably. So one of, one of the other sort of nuggets of this analysis, which is uh, now you know, uh, also being considered as part of the future of storage study that uh, the MIT Energy Initiative is undertaking as part of a broader look at energy storage, is to sort of look at the role for demand flexibility, which is often cited as a mechanism uh, for balancing renewables penetration. And so demand flexibility, which could be things like you know, incentivizing charging of electric cars at certain times of the day uh, can affect the value for energy storage in these systems, but they mostly focus in on short duration storage applications where energy storage is basically being used for intraday energy shifting. So the question really becomes, uh, you know, what, what, so we have talked about opportunities for energy storage within intraday shifting um, and op opportunities for energy storage that are looking at durations in the range of, you know, under 12 hours. Uh, but as we start to think about higher and higher renewables penetration, the question really becomes, you know, what are the what are the technology space and what are the opportunities for longer duration storage technologies? Um, so I'd like to just kind of point your attention to this particular chart from one of the uh, ARPA E funded programs focused on long duration storage, where you know you can look at even with most optimistic lithium ion storage cost assumptions, the the duration at rated power. Um, is occurring at a very high cost and plateaus at a relatively high cost. So one really needs to be thinking about much cheaper energy capital cost technologies to be able to get the desired duration to be able to be um, much beyond sort of the daily cycling element. So, you know, in our, in our group, we have been thinking about, you know, what are the value for some of these long duration technologies um, in deeply decarbonized electricity systems and also understanding, you know, what are the most important design attributes? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of different design uh, attributes for each of these technologies and systems modeling sort of at an early stage can help to prioritize what are the most important design attributes. So we recently published a paper in collaboration with Professor Jesse Jenkins group at uh, Princeton University, uh, where we looked at, um, you know, sort of the design space for long duration storage and energy storage. Um, in, in decarbonized power systems. And, and when we think, when we define the design space, we define the design space based on five broad parameters, looking at the capital costs of the various components, as well as the charging and discharging efficiencies. Um, you can take this sort of five dimensional view of energy storage technologies. We combed sort of the entire literature that's available uh, on, on this topic. And then, you know, came up with these kind of broad, I would say broad strokes, regional classifications on where different energy storage technologies lie. And I will note that this is an evolving target. So, um, you know, this is not meant to be definitive, but it's, it's meant to be illustrative of thinking about these storage technologies on the axis of efficiency, energy capital costs, and power costs. 
So once we have sort of this mapping, uh, we can then um, look at this mapping and its relative value um, in the context of a decarbonized power system. And so the way we define a decarbonized power system is to look at you know, systems that have varying types of demand and renewables availability and costs, as well as competing technologies that are not storage based, um, but also sort of meet low carbon generation requirements. So in the next few slides, I just wanna quickly give you a sense for some of the insights that we got from this work. So this is a chart that's kind of demonstrating um, as a function of round trip efficiency, the power costs on the x-axis and the energy capital costs in each panel, uh, the system cost reduction achieved by um, having long duration storage deployment based on those, those, uh, those five attributes that I mentioned. Um, and so the heat map here basically points to, um, as you go from right to left on this chart, um, as you're decreasing the energy capital costs, you see that the system cost reductions that are achievable by long duration storage technologies tend to become greater and greater, approaching you know, 45 to 50% in some cases. Um, and so this is kind of highlighting sort of how critical uh, energy capital costs are for energy storage technologies, uh, but also some, some guidance on what the key thresholds might be, such as you know, $20 per kilowatt hour seems like a key inflection point for these types of applications. Uh, another important parameter becomes discharge efficiency. So as you sort of look at, uh, here we are showing your round trip efficiency, but if you think about just the discharge efficiency component, um, increasing the round trip efficiency as a result of increasing the discharge efficiency also increases the value of these resources significantly. And the lines that I'm showing you here basically indicate the overlapping between our, our analysis relative to where we think technologies lie today. Another um, sort of aspect that always, uh, you know, has, has been brought up with respect to energy storage technologies is, you know, we're thinking about decarbonization of electricity while at the same time trying to expand the use of electricity for a number of different uses. Um, so these include transportation, these include, you know, residential commercial heating. Um, and so one of the questions we had was to try and understand, um, you know, how does electrification, particularly of energy uses in cold climates where potentially electrification of heating could be significant, uh, added to total demand, impact the overall design space for long duration storage technologies. And so what we find here is that because electrification of heating systems uh, results in sort of winter peaking um, electricity demand, um, the design space shifts towards lower energy capital costs in terms of the threshold energy capital cost requirements. So compared to the previous chart, you see, generally speaking, for the same uh, design point, you would get lower value based simply on the fact that the electricity load profile um, is you know, uh, more, more spaced out um, and includes uh, variations from um, you know, winter peaking um, heating systems. Finally, the very last slide um, talks about basically um, you know, thinking about duration um, as, a, as a metric for energy storage technology. So I'd like to clarify you know, how we define duration here because duration tends to be defined in very different ways. So in our assessment, we are defining duration as the deliverable energy accounting for the discharge efficiency uh, divided by the discharge power capacity. So it is the, it is the duration at the rated power um, of, of, of the long duration storage device. And so what you see is that for the regions where it's most valuable, which was sort of, you know, uh, $20 kilowatt hour and below, uh, perhaps, you know, above 40, 50% round trip efficiency, um, you start to get a sense of what are the kinds of durations where energy storage would add the maximum value to the system. Um, so there's sort of three broad regimes I'd point out. So at the low end, you know, if you have higher, energy capital costs, you're talking about hourly durations, so durations on the order of hours. Um, if you sort of move into the lower energy capital cost territories, then durations are more in the daily. Um, and then if you sort of move to the very low energy capital cost scenarios, then durations end up um, being more on, on the order of weeks. So this gives you a sense of sort of using these kind of design space approaches to sort of understand and evaluate the role for long duration storage technologies. So with that, I'll stop. There's a bunch of um, insights here that I'm sure you can read uh, later on, but I'm happy to turn it back to Sarah and Ramon for questions. Thank you very much, Darek. Uh, yes, we are going to be um, posting these slides, also a recording of the, of the session today, but that'll take a little longer. Um, we have had a lot of really good questions because we're we're kind of tickling the uh, tech questions that that MIT alums like to ask. Um, there are a lot of co-benefits and co uh, co, co 
costs of, of the different ways we make electricity. And I would like to, we, we have a, a lot of questions about the material inputs, which we will get to. I would like to ask first though, about um, the safety of the different kinds of systems, especially the, the flow battery ones. Uh, either of you could answer, certainly it, it's directed at the, at the Infinity system. Sure, yeah, uh, happy to talk about that. Um, you know, we, we like to quip that our battery is more likely to put out a fire than start one. Um, you know, because of its because of its liquid nature, uh, you know, we we do all sorts of testing, you know, both in our lab and with some of the national the national labs, you know, to make sure that we comply with standards like UL ninety five forty A, which is the sort of the the, the quintessential standard for for non flammability in battery systems. Um, for us, that makes a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, not only does it sort of keep ancillary costs low, you know, the you know, we don't need fire suppression, we don't need sort of active fire monitoring on our systems, but it also means that you know, in in installations at close proximity to critical infrastructure, you know, close proximity to you know things like schools, um, you know, the 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 siting and um, install requirements for the batteries, uh, the vanadium flow batteries, are a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, some of the other questions that, that were asked had to do with, uh, you know, aside from vanadium, what, what other elements are needed and how scarce they are, what countries are they're available, um, environmental impacts and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of a general question that I think applies to all storage uh, technologies, whatever you can offer. Actually, sure. let's, let's start with the very specific ones about hard hydrogen. Um, people are... are uh, Jim Papadopoulos uh, in and Claude Gerstel have both asked about um, how flow batteries might relate to um, to hydrogen storage. I mean, because we're trying to talk about storing a lot of energy. I mean, a, a cell phone has what, a 10 to the minus three kilowatt hour <laughs> storage. A car has 10 to the first kilowatt hour storage in the battery. But here we're talking about two megawatts of, of storage and, and um, you know, is that something which hydrogen, a fuel, holds as much energy? Um, how, how do they compare on the on the hydrogen on the hydrogen level? Are there yeah. other benefits? Big benefits. Uh, I'm I'm happy to start, and then dark maybe I'll pass. Sure. To um, look, I I I we um, I spent the first ten years of my career in hydrogen and fuel cells, so can speak a little bit to it. Um, you know, the 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 truth is that. Um, if we were to take that that storage landscape chart that I showed and sort of extend it all the way out to the right, um, you know, there are a number of emerging situations where um, very, very long duration storage makes a ton of sense. You know, when you are trying to take, you know, a, you know, a, a tremendous amount of wind energy generated in the Midwest in the fall and use that to heat homes in the Northeast through the winter. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's a kind of storage that uh, that, you know, electrochemical systems are not particularly good at serving. Um, you can think about the, the relative cost of the power conversion and the relative cost of the storage medium. And when you're generating hydrogen and then using that hydrogen as an energy carrier, you know, the storage medium itself is effectively, can be extremely inexpensive. Those are, you know, those are the kind of characteristics that you would look for in a technology that could serve those, you know, not just hours of storage, but weeks to months of storage. And, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that space, but hydrogen certainly has the potential to step into some of those kinds of, uh, of applications. Yeah. And if I, so that, that, you know, that's, that I think covers most of the stuff with respect to hydrogen's use as a storage resource for the grid. The, the point I'd, I'd, I'd also mention is, you know, hydrogen's also a fuel and energy carrier. Um, and it has, it has values uh, outside electricity that will impact its value very likely in the electricity system. So if you think about all of the difficult to electrify sectors that we have in the economy today, there's growing interest to think about the role for hydrogen. And in some ways, the volumes that might be used for hydrogen in that space might be, you know, much, much higher than the volumes of hydrogen that are used for the grid and might just come along for the ride in some ways, right, from the same set of assets. So in our assessments, you know, we think about hydrogen storage, you know, as, you know, in the framework that I shared, you can think about it just as a storage technology with all of those different components and, and the attributes that Matt described. Uh, but I think the that would only be a very limited view of hydrogen. What you really need to do is kind of expand the envelope and say, where else can hydrogen be used? Um, and what does that do for the economics of hydrogen for the grid? Okay, let me, let me, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. 
I was just going to ask the very specific questions just to make sure we've covered people's things. Mr. Papadopoulos or Professor Papadopoulos uh, said he was seeking an opinion on H2 cavern storage, how it drives fuel cells. What kind of capex dollars per kilowatt hour would it take to make a big difference? And then we also had a question from Claude Gerstel, um, which I can't find again, but it was about the, um, you know, how, how to, how, how are the costs of hydrogen compared with this this battery storage? And again, I think he was thinking strictly of electricity. Is it something that that is a interchangeable, or are the batteries a clear a clear uh, better choice? So I mean, I, I think so. I haven't run the the absolute numbers on on you know what doesn't does make sense in, in in hydrogen storage. But I mean, what I will say is that you know, relatively speaking, compared with uh, with um, with with electrochemical storage, the cost of energy conversion, the sort of going from chemical or you know some other form of energy to electricity, is comparatively high. The cost, especially if you're using underground caverns, of storing that storage medium is comparatively low. And so that what that argues for is very, very long duration storage. Right. Because you're again, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in effect, you know, taking advantage of the, the relative advantages of that energy and, and, and storage side of the equation. Yep. And, and just to add to that, you know, the discharge efficiency, as I, as I mentioned in some of our findings, is a key parameter. So, you know, you lose a lot going from electricity to hydrogen and then back to electricity relative to some of the electrochemical technologies. And so, um, you know, there is a, I think, as you know, there is these multiple time scales that when you have to think about the electricity system and, and you know, different storage technologies may may have a more dominant role. And so hydrogen, as, as Matt highlighted, sort of is more on the, the long duration or the really long duration um, storage uh, realm, depending on how you define it. Mm -hmm. There's there's a question about have have you looked at flow battery applications in railroad locom mm -hmm. locomotives, um, and if so, what point has this work uh, reached? Uh, so we've not. I mean, we look primarily at stationary applications. You know, uh, one of the one of the the, the downside. Well, it could be a downside or it can be a positive. But one of the differences between our technology and lithium ion is that we're comparatively heavier. Um, you know, you're not going to see a vanadium flow battery in a car anytime soon. Now, uh, you know, there are people looking at VFBs for um, for inland shipping applications, especially in Europe, where they have very uh, rigid sort of controls on on emissions from transportation means. I can see possibly where 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 trains could be an application as well, but it's it's not been an active conversation with us to date. Okay, we have a, we have several questions on the um, on the issue of vanadium and other inputs. Uh, uh, you had mentioned that vanadium is is common everywhere around the world. Of course, it is very toxic material. Um, it used to come out of uh, oil power plants uh, that we got oil from Argentina. It's really all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, what other kinds of inputs and life cycle material issues about sustainability for these flow batteries and then in the whole system? Our batteries, we've heard a lot about lithium batteries being, you know, limited sources of extraction and we can't recycle them well. And yep. so what are, what are some of the life cycle material questions about flow batteries and then batteries in general. Sure, so so first of all, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on the vanadium toxicity point. Um, you're absolutely right that, you know, the fly ash and pet coke that comes out of, you know, heavy oil refining and heavy oil burning is 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 a nasty material. Uh, it's not necessarily the vanadium itself that is problematic. It's the the it's the it's the overall waste uh, that it, that contains a lot of vanadium. In our, view, in our view, that's actually a huge opportunity, right? A lot of the vanadium sources that we look at are taking that, you know, that, 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 that spent petroleum coke or, 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 or fly ash and reprocessing it to extract the vanadium. And, and, and therefore, not only are you getting rid of uh, a hazardous waste problem, um, but you're also, you know, gaining, a, you know, an effective and, and, and useful material from that. Um, part of the reason why, you know, the vanadium, I mean, there's a lot of different flow battery chemistries out there. Um, one of the reasons the vanadium uh, system is is so effective at, at, at maintaining that sort of very, very long duration discharge and discharge capability without degrading is because both the positive and the negative couple inside the battery 
use vanadium ions, right? It is both the positive and negative electrolyte are in effect exactly the same material. It's just that on the negative side, you're, you know, switching between a, you know, a plus two and a plus three ionic state. And on the positive, it's between a plus four and a plus five ionic state. What that means is, you know, any crossover between those two doesn't degrade the battery in the long run. That's how we get, you know, 25 to 30 years of service. But it also means that it is exclusively that vanadium material that is the working element inside the system. Aside from that, you know, vanadium suspended in, 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 in sulfuric acid and in, in essentially battery acid, uh, same as what you'd be, what would be in your car battery. The rest of the, of, of, the, of the product is, like I think I said earlier, about 95% by weight is polyethylene, steel, aluminum, copper, you know, really just common, common materials that can be completely recycled inside existing, um, you know, municipal or, or industrial recycling programs. You know, one question, um, um, Derek, in, in, in your work, you mentioned how you're looking at these complex combinations of scenarios to try to identify uh, within the whole range of design uh, possibilities where uh, innovation is best or efforts at innovation are best targeted or funding or whatever. One, I wonder uh, if both of you can comment on from the, not just the technology side, but from the other side, the regulation and the other things that affect what actually gets uh, recognized as value in, in, in tariff setting and all that kind of stuff. Where do you see uh, storage uh, needing, you know, greater recognition because of this rapidly changing uh, set of values. Yeah, so I, I can start and maybe Matt, since you're sort of in the business world, you'll have a much more practical perspective on this. Uh, so from, from our perspective, you know, what we see is that, you know, much of the value for storage in many of these applications, especially if you're thinking about high value applications uh, that are also sort of, you know, involving large quantities of energy storage deployment, they may not be monetizable in today's market constructs. So just to give you an example, um, if you think about storage as a deferral asset for transmission, um, in many jurisdictions in the US, that, that's not actually a viable alternative that's being contemplated. Um, and storage as in terms of being able to provide capacity, for example, um, is, a, is a moving target in terms of how much capacity storage can provide to the system as a function of the system condition. And so, the, the capacity market rules basically have to keep up basically with the evolving grid dynamics to be able to, be able to remunerate storage. Um, and, and you're seeing movement in that front, you know, in different parts of the country. Um, so so th there, is, there is regulation that's, that's needed in some ways to, to be able to remunerate storage for all the value that it can provide. And, and there is some movement in that frame, but uh, it does not you know, what we are modeling here is a very much a purist and idealistic scenario that captures the full value. And in reality, there are still many markets that are not available for storage. Yeah, look, I, I, I totally agree with you and, and reinforce some of those points. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen, we do a lot of our business in parallel with the solar industry. And what we've seen in solar in the last couple of years, especially in California around things like net energy metering um, are, are situations where there's a tremendous you know, battle between the regulators and and sort of some of the solar companies around, you know, what the right way of regulating these technologies and installations are. Um, because of that, I think that, you know, some of the regulators have taken more taken a more sort of proactive approach to trying to understand what storage can do before they sort of set the rules around it, which is, of course, frustrating for us. We want the rules here today so we can sell into it. But, uh, but uh, you know, it's actually, you know, that measured approach is not necessarily a bad one. The thing that is beneficial to us, I think, is that we see, we've seen over and over again in specific projects where, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use the example of uh, the, the project I showed you uh, some data from in, in South Australia. Um, you know, we approached the regulator and said, look, we want to install solar plus storage. And they said, well, there's, there's no rules for that. You know, we're, we don't know how to permit you, uh, you know, go back to the drawing board. And what we were able to go to them in, with was, you know, a series of arguments around, look, what we're doing is we're taking solar energy. You already have an excess of that energy. We're going to move it to a more beneficial portion of the day. At the same time, we're going to be doing, you know, regulation services. At the same time, we're going to be, you know, providing Black Start, you know, in that particular region of the grid. That stacking of values on top of one another, you know, again, different pieces of the Swiss Army knife, uh, is a great argument to be able to go to the regulator and say, look, this benefits a number of different portions of what you're trying to do. Let's figure out a way to make it happen. I'd like to mention that uh, in Massachusetts, the Clean Energy uh, Council, CEC, Mass CEC has just um, 
is is just about finishing up a round of of projects to look at storage as pilot and how to how to how to develop the market. And I believe that we are kind of at the front of the the pack in trying to figure out the regulatory questions, the permitting questions. Uh, but the Mass CEC has quarterly reports on these different pilot projects that they're doing uh, to try and see how how it works. Now it's it's not. Um, they're not big storage. Uh, they're they're mostly the pilots that people proposed were mostly based on lithium batteries and power walls and things, but it is a, another source for information on that. Uh, there was some very specific question here about uh, how much storage capacity. Look, Frechette asked how much storage capacity would be required to match the renewable generation in 2030 or 2050. And what technologies are the, the best at the, this point for the scale of what's needed? So I, I, I love these questions because this is exactly what I would like to answer myself. <laughs> uh, and, and we're working on it, but I think the, 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 one, um, the one thing we know is it's very much region dependent. And you know, uh, as I showed in some of the examples that we looked at, the value of storage is impacted not just by what storage is and what the technology definition is, but also by everything else that's happening on the system. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd be very brave if I'm going to be making some guesses. <laughs> um, Matt, you used the phrase uh, black start. Uh, one of the questions uh, uh, from Robert Poor was, how would a black restart work with flow batteries? Yeah, and, and again, it's it's one of the, I mean, we have our batteries today operating in, in microgrid applications um, and, and sort of, uh, uh, you know, backup power. Um, so certainly at a, at a commercial and industrial level um, or a microgrid level, you know, we're able to execute that today. Um, black start at, the, at, you know, of the grid is, uh, you know, something that that is, uh, you know, a scale that um, is is beyond what we currently do, but certainly, you know, uh, fundamentally, the tech the technology is capable of of doing those kind of black start applications. A question from Peter Dreyer: uh, How much would time of day residential electricity prices curb demand during peaks and make storage unnecessary? Yeah, so I, I think um, the example that I highlighted about flexible demand is kind of alluding to that point. So you you see that, you know, if you do have demand flexibility that could be enabled by just, you know, tariffs that could be enabled by behind the meter resources, um, a combination of factors, um, you can affect the amount of grid scale storage that you would need, but primarily sort of in the intraday time frame, right? So you're not really going to be dealing with weekly peaks or weekly sort of, you know, uh, needs for storage or even multi-day needs for storage by not charging your car. Uh, but you can certainly manage the sunrise and sunset peaks that you create on the system by just deferring when you charge your car. So it can make a pretty substantial difference in that in that setting. That's good. That's great. Um, there, Trevor asked whether um, the combination of lithium ion plus flow batteries might work well, because of the duration and the discharge characteristics, is that possible? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, the biggest um, the biggest standalone storage project we're building right now is uh, at the Energy Super Hub Oxford over in the UK, um, and that's a hybrid system of of flow of our flow batteries with a, a large lithium array. Um, essentially, what we do is we provide sort of the tip of the spear, right? The fir the very first response when that plant is called to provide power. And then only when that response, you know, exceeds a certain threshold or exceeds a certain duration, the lithium ion batteries are called into play. That means that they're cycling less frequently, um, you know, the, and therefore- They're your peakers. That's right. We're the peaking plant within the plant. And the, and the lithium is the peak for, for your vanadium flow. Um, Mr. We have about one minute left for questions because I wanted to wrap this up, but Dazed uh, has asked about uh, vanadium flow battery round trip efficiency and also um yeah let's start with that one sure yeah at the, at the cell level we're about uh 85 percent which is you know, slightly lower than lithium but uh not materially so the big advantage though is that we don't see degradation of round trip efficiency over time so as whereas a lithium cell might lose 20 percent rte over its life uh we stay roughly at that same number throughout this is great wow well this has certainly been good discussion I want to emphasize that that we are trying with our network to provide a lot of uh, platform for alums to get together, 
you, you have the people's names. If you are an alum, you can get into our directory and write to these people directly or write back to EESN. Uh, visit our website, uh, EESN, it, EESN alum group, mit.edu. Um, and it's been a pleasure having you folks today. This was a very interesting and lively discussion that we that we had. It's a very important issue coming coming up. And if people want to join EESN and help us with the monthly webinars like this, or if you have a an event going on in your club, your MIT club or your area that you happen to participate in, we'd be more than happy to help promote it and to connect you with other people doing the same. Uh, it, we have a group of ambassadors from the different clubs and regions which you could join and, and get some of this information flowing about what different groups of alums are doing around the world on energy, environment, and sustainability. And today we often call that climate action. So yeah. also, <laughs> I hope uh, you'll all join us again next month. We will We will try to get answers to, if the speakers are uh, amenable to it, to some of the questions that we never got to. Um, and thank you for the audience. We know that some of you repeat uh, your attendance. Uh, one of the things we're always finding very helpful is if you have suggestions for topics that you would like to, uh, or speakers that you would like to, have us consider in our in our programming. So goodbye for this month. Have a great spring. Enjoy your uh, changing situation for our lockdowns. And thank you very much, Matt and Derek. Thank you. Both. Bye now. <laughs>